Hello, and welcome to Common's Current Events Roundtable. Today, I am very honored to have a very young guest. I usually have guests that kind of look like myself and probably around the same age as myself. And today, I have a guest that is 20 years old who is a researcher at a very young age, and I'm very, very, very proud to uh, talk to Tom O'Donnell. Tom, welcome Hi, to Conman's Current Events Roundtable. And Tom's done a lot of research on economics, abundance, uh, scarcity, and even aging. And uh, maybe he's uh, even my aging. I could look, start to look like you, maybe if I uh, if I follow everything you're, you you looked up and what you're talking about. I think uh, I may end up uh, the same age. Hopefully, I hope so too. But I would like to start off with just reading a little something from a book that I saw, and um, it was uh, it was something that Robert Malthus said. He said that we predict things that do not happen, we fail to predict things that do, and sometimes get it exactly backwards. Robert Malthus, in the 19th century, he warned that because our population was growing, our food production was not, and we'll soon starve. Well, I'll soon starve, I can't believe this. Of course we haven't, just the opposite has happened. Farmers now grow more food, and less land. So everything that Robert Malthus said is no longer, it, it, he's not correct about it. We still have a lot of food. And people don't realize that because we hear of countries that are starving. And um, you maybe you could tell us in some of the research that you have done at such an early age um, why we're not starving. But I just want to ask before we start uh, why we're not starving is how did you how did you, at, you know, at your age, get interested in this topic? Sure. Um, so you know, when I was like 15, five years ago, um, I found out there were a lot of chemicals and like poisons in Pepsi, you know, what we drink, and uh, then found out a lot of food and other products have those similar uh, product uh, chemicals that result in disease for people. So that really frightened me. And uh, that just kind of opened up a door of, you know, what else is wrong with the world besides, like, all the, you know, disease we have and all these chemicals. There's also a lot of, uh, you know, problems, like you would just mention, people starving and, uh, you know, poverty and stuff like that. So why does that exist? So um, I really kind of drilled down to try to understand it to maybe come up with a solution someday. Do you have other friends that uh, do the same thing you do? Uh, no. Uh, I'm the only one I know of. I'm sure there's other, obviously there's other people who research, but um, no one I know as far as like, you know, it's uh, my age. You know, we talked earlier, at, we were at Bluegrass Restaurant having our lunch today, and we, I have even mentioned that I did even a little bit of research myself. My husband was going to over, he was getting uh, an operation recently, and uh, it was going to be where he had to stay in the hospital for several days, and it was going to be um, probably months of recuperation. And I happened to find some research. I did my own research and found that there was a new uh, study being done at Northwestern Hospital here in Chicago. And, uh, and the type of operation that he needed, I, I checked it out like you you know, I, w I have been talking to you, and you've been talking about research, and I thought, hey, I'm going to do some research, and found there was a technique that was being done, and it's a, the same thing that they wanted to do to him, but it was an it was a um, it was just where he would they would operate or do the procedure within an hour, and he could go home the very same day, and it's working, and it's because I followed your example. When we met uh, a couple of months ago, you know, we talked about what you did, right. and I thought, hey, maybe I should do some research. Did it? Found out that, you know, it wasn't. He didn't have to go through all the months of recuperation, and he was able to get this procedure, and you know, he's getting better. So right. I want to thank you oh. for, you know, also here. He's 20, and I'm. I don't tell my age, but um, <laughs> um, a little bit older than you, and you gave me the incentive to do that, and look what I did, and I'm very proud of what I did, and thank you very much no for problem. 
you know, learning from younger people. It's like uh, my, if my phone goes bad, I ask my grandchildren, not my children, right. and, they, and they help me. So it's for, for you to start research, what, what gave you, you know, um, the incentive to, you know, you, you talked about a little bit that you've been homeschooled. Right. And uh, could that be, you know, tell me a little bit about why you were homeschooled and what you weren't getting from uh, the actual schools that you were supposed to be going to. Sure. Um, so I went to high school, you know, for a couple years. And, um, you know, what they were teaching is that in economics there's scarcity. That's the fundamental fundamental problem of life, that there's not enough resources to go around, and that's why there's always going to be, you know, conflicts and problems in the world. So, you know, like you were saying, um, you know, you like to research things yourself, and uh, I wanted to verify that because I wanted to make sure it was true. Trust but verify, like uh, Ronald Reagan said. <laughs> so um, I did the research and found out that the opposite is true. We actually have an abundant supply of resources, and uh, that means it's possible to solve all these problems. So um, school was lying to me and everyone else by teaching us scarcity, and uh, I just didn't think it made sense to pay money to be taught lies. So I interesting. So uh, if you were teaching a course on economics, how would you do differently? Um, sure. So I would have a little, uh, I guess, a little presentation that kind of explains how I would teach it. Okay, sounds good. So just, you know, a premise, I use logic, facts, and observation. And, uh, you know, the purpose of education, why we go to school today is ultimately, you know, learn how to compete in the global economy to survive. And, uh, you know, that's what Forbes magazine says, the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, the National Education Association, etc. So those are like the uh, people who, you know, are in charge of education. The home and our parents are our primary influence on our education. You know, for instance, we're all taught at a young age, nothing's free in life and you got to work and get a job and that's in your best interest. And uh, we all accept that, but no one really asks, well, how come nothing is free? So A good question. Why isn't anything free? Well, I'm going to get get to that good. and uh, see why. So then school is our secondary influence and we, you know, rely on schools to teach us true information. So, for instance, um, you know, what every college in the world teaches, and just some examples like Northwestern, uh, DePaul, any college, they all teach the first lesson of economics is the law of supply and demand. If supply is greater than demand, it's free. If it's less than demand, it's uh, not free. So just some examples, let's say you have uh, 10 apples and you need one. That means you have an abundant supply, 90% more than you need. If you have 10 apples and you need 10 apples, that's a sufficient supply, you know, you have enough. Now, if you have 10 apples and you need 11 or more, well, then you have a limited supply. So those are, are the uh, you know, examples of supply and demand in action. The second lesson of economics is that the reality is we have a scarcity and limited supply of land, food, and shelter, so that's why things aren't free. And this isn't you know, my opinion on the subject. Um, if you look in any college economics textbook, the first chapter you know, clearly defines economics as uh, the study of how we use scarce resources. So then they say the third lesson is, if we had an abundant supply of land, food, and shelter instead of a limited, that means things would be free because of supply and demand. We would cooperate, and it would be like fantasy land where everyone's needs and wants are met. So it's just this theoretical. Um, but how does money get, I mean, like we, we, we talked a little bit earlier today about Africa and how people are starving in Africa and we, we heard that there are countries and foundations that are supposedly funding uh, Africa so people don't starve and yet there's people starving. Why are people starving if there's so much abundance out there? Um, I think it's because we have a bad law that says uh, you can't live unless you have money. And if you don't have money, you're out of luck and uh, you can't have, have what you need. Um, it's similar like in the Great Depression. People were starving and uh, even though we had plenty of food, they were still starving because they didn't have money. So I think it's the result of a you know, bad set of laws that we have. And you could grow your own food. I remember during the, uh, the Depression, there were a lot of, um, we call them, I guess they were called victory gardens then. People would find some land, you know, free land, and nobody was, you know, nobody was uh, 
using it. There was no houses on it. It was kind of, it was garbage on it, like slummy and everything. And um, people started growing uh, their own vegetables and there were their gardens and they call it victory gardens. Why can't people grow, you know, if you have land, you know, why can't you just grow? Um, I have a friend who ha in his backyard, in his it's completely a farm. He took his, this whole backyard, he took away his patio, took away everything, and all, and he grows lettuce and vegetables and rows and rows. It looks like a, a small farm. Why don't people just do that? Um, I, I think it's because they don't have the money. I mean, if you do have the money, you can do that, but if you don't, then, you know, that's the law of the world today. If you don't have money, you can't uh, do what you want. Like the Indians, they were able to do what you're saying, like, uh, you know, having their own farm because, you know, there wasn't private property and things were free, so. Because, you know, um, it's just that you would think if people can farm their land, but you're talking about that land, you know, in those days, in the 40s, where there was pieces of property and nobody was building on it, people would just turn it into a, a garden and plant their vegetables and stuff. And you, you would think with such an abundance of food and, and people are starving all over the world, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it, it just kind of shows that it's a poor reflection on our system that even though there's enough, there's still a lot of people starving. So um. so what would you recommend? What, you know, you, you know you're, some of your things are very futuristic, you know, um, and um, I, I would like to get your opinion what would you do to change? How would, you know, I think um, you told me to read uh, a couple of books, which I, um, I kind of got the synopsis of it. Uh, one is called Equality by Edward Bellamy, and the other one um, was the, um, the, what was the, the other one that he has was? Um, it's um, called Looking Backward. Looking, it was, right, uh, by Edward Bellamy mm -hmm. also. Oh, here it is, I got that. Right. Belt. Yeah, and he talks about um, uh, set centrality of public life, equality of labor, elimination of money. That was that was very interesting. Elimination sure. of money, because you you talk about everything, everything that we need uh, in, in order to get it. You know, besides just our air. Right. <laughs> breathing our air and, and someday, I mean right now we have free water but someday we probably won't. Uh, elimination of money, what, what, is, what is that about? Um, well again it kind of goes back to uh, the, sec the lessons of economics that it says if you have a scarce amount of things and you need money to regulate it so you know you don't run out and we use things efficiently but then the economics book also says if we had an abundant supply in theory money is unnecessary because there's so much of everything that you really don't need to regulate it. So, um, you know, since we have an abundant supply today of, you know, land, food, and shelter, in theory, we don't need money to, you know, get it. You know, but. So there. So in 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 the in Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, he talks about the elimination of money, and he also talks about um, uh, a credit. Everybody would get. Uh, a credit corresponding to a share of annual product the nation is given to every citizen. Everybody would get a credit card that would be issued to them, and uh, everybody would have the same amount of money or same amount on their credit card. Sure, and I think basically like the credit card was just to keep track of things and basically it allowed everyone to live a millionaire lifestyle. So some people would say, oh, well, that sounds like communism, but in communism it's, you know, everyone's poor, but under the system Bellamy was describing, it was kind of like everyone was rich. So that's a, a, a big difference. And this book was written uh, how many years ago? Um, 1888, and it was the second most popular book of the uh, 19th century behind um, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. So, um, that, that is so interesting. I mean, I, I was looking at some of these things that um, uh, it, it, it is, is it called, is it merged from scientific socialism? Um, you know, in his book Equality, he kind of